I'll be reading Luke 19, 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead of him and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming this way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, 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 here and now I give half of my possession to the poor if I have cheated. Anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times that amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of this word. So we're in the story of Zacchaeus this morning. This is the last story uh, in Luke's gospel um, for this church year. The next two story, the next two Sundays before Advent. We'll be looking at uh, texts from Thessalonians, one of uh, Paul's writings. Uh, but one of the things that I think is, is really intriguing about this story is it, it brings up the issue of who Jesus is and what it means to uh, come into relationship with him. This is not a neutral, passive relationship for you to come to know Jesus. It is life-changing. I mean, I think we all kind of know that. Um, I've told you my story. Uh, I went to church my whole life. Parents made me go every Sunday. The only time I was not in church is if I was sick. And then I became a member of the church. They made me go through catechism. They made me. Notice that. I didn't volunteer. Gee, I want to go to catechism. I went through catechism, and then I went through the formal ceremony at the front of the church, and I became a member. And then I stopped attending because it was not anything about me or Jesus. It was all about I was obeying my parents. They, they, they laid a foundation. Please hear me. That's a great foundation, but it was not me. It, I was, I knew about Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus. It wasn't until in college that through Campus Crusade, which is now called Crew, and not even officially Crusade, but somebody who'd been involved with it, they shared the gospel with me, and my life has never been the same since. I'm not going to say that there are radical changes, but uh, it's never been the same since. I never perceived that I would be a pastor, and yet here I am. Um, but there is something about Jesus that's unsettling to the status quo. Jesus does, I, I know we talk about him as our friend and our lover and all that kind of stuff, but there is this side of Jesus that once you get to see him and you spend time in the Gospels, you start to recognize that that there is some unease in knowing this guy. So Jesus refused to be stereotyped or to fit any kind of mold in regards to what people expected of him. You're, uh, he would say, well, I'm the Messiah. And everybody who was in the know, all those guys, uh, people who studied the Bible, the Old Testament, they all knew what the Messiah was supposed to look like. Jesus didn't fit that mold. Uh, because he had created a new mold in who he was. And in today, in this story, we get to see that this is another story where Jesus refuses to fit the religious mold that was being impressed upon him by Pharisees and Sadducees and others. And just kind of as an opening question, then, what, what, what molds do we put Jesus in? What, what molds do we have of Jesus, expectations of him that he doesn't own, all right? He would say, this isn't me. But we expect him to, this is who you are. Because when you read the New Testament, or at least the Gospels, you continually come across this where people think, oh, I know what the Messiah looks like. And then Jesus says, uh, I don't look that way, do I? So we can stereotype him even now, just like they did then, and be wrong. We get a hint of how different Jesus is in chapter 1 of Luke. I want to do some contexting 
before we get into Zacchaeus' story. We have this thing of Mary's song, or it's also known as the Magnificat. So she is responding to the fact that she's going to have a child as a virgin. Uh, and she, so she says, God has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. So this coming of Christ is a dramatic intrusion into history in our world. Everything, there, there is this turning of upside down of everything. That's what Mary is saying, that these life will not be the same. Uh, folks who are powerful will lose their powerful power. Folks who are weak will become, they'll be lifted up. Hungry people will be fed. Rich people will be made empty. Now, this is not necessarily saying that all those folks are evil. It's just saying that the kingdom of God is arranged differently than the kingdoms we know, our own political system. Later, Jesus comes of age and he reads the scriptures in a synagogue, which appear to declare his core values of ministry in Luke. So there we read in chapter 4 of Luke, Jesus is up there, he opens the scroll, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So let me just back up a minute here and say, don't just read this as if it's talking about someone out there. Because I'll tell you, in this story, in this verse, he proclaims good news to the poor. That's me. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captive. That was me. And the recovery of sight to the blind. That was me. And to set liberty of those who are oppressed. That's me and that's you. Whether you feel it or not. You don't see God as clearly as you could, so you are blind. There are ways of the world that you're captive to. And Jesus is here to set you free to it. All that is what he, is do he does for people when he comes into our lives. Or in other words, let me read this. The message of the gospel is good news for those afflicted and in need. It is new freedom and liberty for those in bondage and the oppressed. It is restoration of sight to the blind it is, in short, the time and place of God's favor upon those incapable of gaining it by their status or capabilities. These images are first physical in meaning, but they have a spiritual application as well. There is no inherent virtue in being poor or oppressed or in bondage, but these experiences typically correspond to and foster a certain condition of heart and soul. When we recognize our brokenness, and bondage, and blindness, the gospel meets us fully and restores us. The gospel applies to our lives at the level of our whole person, not only our need for sin forgiveness, we apply the full gospel to ourselves by looking to Jesus for restoration in every area of our lives, not just in the spiritual realm, recognizing that full restoration may await heavenly fulfillment. All right, that's a lot. What's it mean? You recognize that in the world today, the place where significant churches began in Europe, the number of Christians has drastically decreased. It's, there's almost a correlation between as a nation gains economic stability and wealth, the belief in Jesus goes down. And now it's affecting us in the U.S. There are fewer and fewer people who claim Christ or faith. They're called the nuns and all these other, N-O-N-E-S. Because as we live in a wealthy society, we feel less and less need for Jesus as he is. We might invent some other Jesus. And where the church is actually growing is in developing countries like Africa, in India, where people have needs, and they recognize these needs, and they reach out to Jesus for the help that they need. Somewhere in the Bible, Jesus says, I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. 
And if you're sick, you know you're sick. And there are parts of the world where folks are struggling to make life, meet their life needs. And those are the places where the church is growing. Here in the U.S., we can get by without Jesus, or we think we can. So in this story, to come into full contact with Jesus, the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Son of Man, will result in a change in our seeing and being. And the problem is, uh, for many of us, me included, it was the biggest hurdle for me, was what do I need Jesus for? I don't really see myself as much of a sinner, and I really think he's given me a mind and an education that I can handle almost anything that would come around the corner. And I just failed to see that there was a deeper need, a deeper brokenness, something that only Jesus could take care of in me that I could not take care of myself. The presence of the kingdom of God is already here. It started when Jesus went to the cross, died, resurrected, ascended. The kingdom of God is here in you and me, wherever the Holy Spirit is present. The church is the purveyor of that. Whether we do it well or do it poorly, we are still the body of Christ. He does it so when it works its way, uh, the way of Jesus and not the way of the world, we are radically changed. And these two approaches, the way of the kingdom and Jesus, in the way of the world are incompatible. They don't work together. So I'm just going to use Dan. It's not in my notes here. So, the, you know, the region, they're, they're, they have to be physically, phys, physically, how do you say it? Thank you. Responsible. At the same time, they have to do it in a Christian way. So that means they make decisions about money that might not seem smart in a business mode, but they're not in a business. They're in a ministry. And us as a church, we have to make decisions about how we allocate funds, not necessarily in a smart business mode. doesn't mean that we're not responsible, but the, God, the kingdom is going to call us to do some things that just might not make sense. Because God will say, I'll take care of some things and others we won't. And you know what? That's just the way it is. But there is a huge difference in incompatibility of the way the world wants to do things and the way the kingdom wants it. So the incompatibility of Jesus is noted here uh, in his stated purpose to reach out to the poor and all these folks. And he goes against the religious norms and understanding of the people in today's text. Zacchaeus is a very wealthy tax collector. And he is more than just a tax collector. He's the chief tax collector, which means he's got folks working for him to collect tax. And He's doing it probably in your and my purview would be very corruptly, even though that's the way the system was then. It is not a grace-filled tax system that he's using. It is one that is just open to all kinds of graft and corruption, and that's why tax collectors were hated more than anything else. There's no fairness in this system. There's no uh, tax based on how much you earn or anything like that. It's just, this is the tax, and... Uh, the tax collector is going to take that tax plus whatever overhead he needs, and the chief tax collector is going to take that tax plus even more overhead. And this is just a messed up system. Corrupt, again, because he made a profit, again, by getting taxes and then collecting even more. If that, you need to understand that in this story. He's also an outcast among his own people, assuming he's a Jew, and I do, it appears that he, was, uh, that he was, since Jesus proclaims at the end of the story, that Zacchaeus is a son of Abraham. So Jesus is passing through Jericho. He's on his trip back to Jerusalem to where he will meet the cross and, and do everything important for us. Uh, this trip began in chapter 9, and we've been looking at different stories along the way, and they're all dealing with discipleship issues of what it means to follow Jesus. But let me quickly review two stories that were skipped over by the lectionary uh, that ha occurred after last week's message. The first story is called, in most Bibles, the story of the rich ruler. The rich ruler is a young guy who comes to Jesus, and he says, hey, what must I do to, uh, to get eternal life? And Jesus says to him, well, what does the law say? And he says, well, you know, don't do this, do that, whatever. And he says, I've done this ever since I was a young boy. You know, it'd be like for us to follow the Ten Commandments. I've done that. And then Jesus says, okay, uh, well, take everything you have, sell it, and give it to the poor. And this rich young man walks away sad because he can't do it. He just can't do it. And then the punchline of the story is Jesus says, um, 
how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So let's just be clear. It's impossible for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. You can't do it. I, there's your assignment for the week. Buy a camel, get a needle, try to sue it. I just, you know, I guess you could grind it up, but it'd be pretty messy, and I don't even like that picture. But anyway, uh, Jesus is saying it's very hard. Okay, that's what he's saying. He's not saying it's impossible. He's saying it's very hard. Again, the status quo here is disrupted because for them, wealth would be a sign that God's hand is on them and they've been blessed and everything is right with their life because they're wealthy. It's proof that God loves them. This is what it goes and look, we got it in our own country. We got guys who preach that God, if he's with you, you'll be healthy, wealthy, wise, right? So they're shocked at this. They're shocked that when he says, they're just shocked that this guy walks away and he, Jesus says it's, it's really hard for a wealthy guy to get into the kingdom of heaven. Then the next story after this is the healing of a blind beggar. Uh, this man is right in the wheelhouse of all those Lucan proclamations that I read earlier. He approaches, he's, again, Jesus is walking along the road, and this blind man hears all this commotion, and he approaches Jesus, and he calls out, says, please have mercy on me. Uh, uh, please help me. And Jesus walks up to him, and I love, always love this. He, he asks the beggar, what is it that you want me to do for you? Uh, well, I'm blind. You know, he's, he, obviously he's not a 21st century American because, you know, my response would be, duh, I can't see. Aren't you supposed to be smart? You know, <laughs> no, but here's the deal. You got to know what's wrong with you. So Jesus asked him, what, what do you need me to do for you? Because if you, you know what? He kind of said that to the rich young ruler. Well, sell all you have. The rich young ruler said, I've kept the law, I'm wealthy. And when Jesus told him, sell it all, he had an opportunity to say, at least say this, I can't do that, Jesus. I can't. I, I'm too connected to my wealth. But he didn't. He walked away. The conversation ended. This guy says, I need sight. And because he knew what was wrong with him and he said it, Jesus healed him. He says, your faith has made you well. The rich young man had no identifiable need as far as we could tell in his story, and he walked away. But this beggar, he had a big need he couldn't see, and Jesus dealt with it. What's your need? What's your need that only Jesus can do? What's your need? If Jesus showed up here today and he came to you and he said, what is it you want me to do for you? What would you say to him? Because if you don't have an answer... So he comes to Zacchaeus. He was a rich man who at least had a need to see Jesus. That's what we get from the story because he had a need to see Jesus. We don't know why, but it's extraordinary because he does two things. He runs, and this was before the joy of running books, so people weren't out there jogging for their health, okay? And if you were in a position of a chief tax collector, you didn't run anyway. You would walk because there's dignity to that. Secondly, he climbed a tree. Most grown-ups don't do that. I'm not saying grown-ups don't. But he, most grown-ups... You ever... Ernest, the CEO of John Deere, you ever see him climb a tree? <laughs> Doesn't mean he does it, right? I, <laughs> you get to a certain point in life, you don't do it. You get to a certain level, you don't do it. So there's this extraordinary need in Zacchaeus to see Jesus. But Jesus turns the table on him. Because as Jesus walks down, he looks up in the tree, and it says, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and, revived, and received him joyfully. Uh, Zacchaeus received Jesus joyfully. 
Now, what happens in the crowd is they just start grumbling because, again, Jesus is hanging out with the wrong people like he does all through the Gospel of Luke and Matthew, Mark, and John. I mean, that's just who Jesus is. But Zacchaeus, through this interchange with the king of kings, is no longer the same man he was when he climbed that tree. He climbed that tree one person, and he comes down a different person because Jesus has to stay at his house today, and he receives Jesus joyfully. He obeys Jesus' wish and received him. This was more than hospitality. This was a life-changing encounter with the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Son of Man, the Son of God. Listen to what it means to meet and receive Jesus. Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Jesus didn't ask him uh, to sell everything. This was a response to meeting Jesus and joyfully receiving him. He just asked to be shown some hospitality, but in response to his presence, Zacchaeus, just his life is different. He is no longer focused on taxes. He's now focused on making, uh, rest, to restoring money to people he has cheated, and most of the people he would have run into, he has cheated goes back to what John the Baptist said earlier in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 3 when he's out baptizing people and telling them to repent of their sins. He says there in chapter 3, 8, Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abram as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. I've told you that story uh, when we were in El Paso, uh, a couple came to the pastor of the church, and he asked both of them if they were Christian, and the, the, the woman, the bride-to-be, said yes, and the groom said, well, my dad was a gardener in a church. Okay. What does that mean? It's almost like saying, well, I'm of the children of Abraham. This is an automatic. I'm in... I've participated in some area or zone, so I have therefore caught the Christian disease. And it doesn't work that way, because John the Baptist says, the no way we know that you have actually repented is that there is a sign, a change, a different motive or thought process in who you are. Because you can't interact with God and be the same, or as one song I heard this weekend say, I can't follow you, God, and stay where I am. So how many of us have tried to follow God, but want to stay right where we are? Most of us in this room this morning are Gentiles and not Jews, and we have the same problem. Many of us have come from some religious background that has given us a perspective similar to what John says here. Both my parents were Christians and churchgoers who made me attend every Sunday. I said that already. But that attendance is not, is not something to give me assurance of my salvation. Like I told you, I joined a church. I went through everything I needed to do. And honestly, from my perspective now, uh, the distance between me and Jesus was huge. Now, but what I will say that is so good is the distance between Jesus and me was minimal. He was just waiting and wooing and saying, come on, Tim. Live your life out the way you're kind of demonstrating it in your church thing right now. But you, you, need, to, you need to give me your heart. Let's go. Jesus goes on to say, today salvation comes to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. This is what Jesus is all about. He is seeking and saving the lost. That is what he has called you and me to do. If Jesus is in us, if we're Christians, yes, we can seek a good career. Yes, we can seek a spouse. Yes, we can pray for children. Yes, we can pray to go on the mission field. Yes, we can pray to be successful. But ultimately, what the gospel tells us 
is that we would have broken hearts for those who are lost because that's where our God is. I heard a Jewish story talking about the story of the Red Sea where Israel has escaped Egypt and they've gotten across uh, on the dry land and then as they get on the other side, the Egyptians pursue them and the waters come back and all this Egyptian army is destroyed in the flood and there's a big party on the other side and people are cheering and they say, well, where's God? Where's God? And somebody says, he's weeping for all those Egyptian souls that died. Have you ever thought of that? He came to seek and to save the lost. That was me, even if I didn't know I was lost. That was you, if you're a Christian here this morning. And he goes on to say, Zacchaeus is a Christian, even if that label was not yet available. He, is, he, he says he's a son of Abraham. That's not through DNA. Because if you read so in Romans 4.16, it says this. It depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on faith and be guaranteed to all of his descendants, not only to the adherents to the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. Abram is the father of many nations. People in all those nations who demonstrate faith in Jesus Christ are Christians, but also we could be defined as sons of Abraham because we are like him as people of faith. Galatians 3 says, So you see, those who believe in the descent are the descendants of Abraham. If we believe in Jesus Christ, we are the descendants of Abraham. And that is who Zacchaeus now is because he has demonstrated faith through his response with a changed life. Those who follow Jesus become instruments of his mercy. You and I are instruments of his mercy and love because, or perhaps there are times when judgment is necessary, but God is the judge, and, but he has called us most of the time to be representatives of mercy and love and grace. And the church, I believe, is at its most impressive and culture changing time when it acts in these unpopular powers of grace, mercy, and love. So are you looking to see Jesus? Here's how you do it. Invite him into your home. Invite him into you. Embrace him with all that you have. There's no half-stepping on this. You need to say, Jesus, come I'm willing to do whatever it is. Show me your love. Show me your grace. Show me your mercy. Show me you really exist. Come and do something. If you have already invited him in, what has been the result of his communion with you? Uh, if you are in relationship with him, then something has, has to have changed. A perspective, a, a judgment, something. He is doing something in you if you are with him and it can be quite remarkable. I can't tell you what it is because it is between you and him. But can I tell you, he will not leave you alone. He is working on you to make you the kind of person he created you to be. Someone who will seek out the lost, who will weep over the lost, and however that manifests itself. Do you demonstrate the mercy and love of Jesus in your life? Do you trust in him more than any, uh, more and more rather than in your earnings and your savings or your education or whatever? Where is your trust? Is it in him? What do you think of the poor and the oppressed? Do you think that they are poor and oppressed because of their own behaviors? Or do you maybe see something else in it? And in the ultimate reality, what does it matter if they need Jesus Christ? God is calling his church, his body, his hands, his feet to serve him in unimaginable ways to seek out and save the lost. That's you and me, brothers and sisters. And he's going to call us out of our comfort zones. I hate being discomforted, right? I don't know about you. As an introvert, I don't want to deal with some people in my life. And yet that's what God's calling me to. And I confess I'm not the best at it, but I'm open, and I have done it, and I will continue to do it. And he's calling you too. Amen?
Let's pray. Lord, thanks for getting us together this morning. I pray for each and every one of us in this room. We all have struggles, and we ask that your hand would touch those struggles. We all have blind spots. Our, our stereotype of maybe who you are, Lord, and how you should act in each situation, Lord, rectify those things. Give us sight so that we can see where we are in our constructing of who you are and how you should interact in our lives. And lastly, Lord, help us to get outside of ourselves and serve you uh, in whatever capacity we can so that more lost people can be found. So that their lives can be full, fully orbed, and that they can enjoy this abundant life that comes only through Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name we all say amen. Amen. Thank you.